Hello, friends and listeners. Matisse here with a brief disclaimer about the episode you're about to hear. I biff this, folks, if I'm being completely honest. I let the Yuletide season get the best of me. I got too festive. And I had a few too many holiday cocktails before and during the recording of this episode. So at times, several times, the conversation kinda devolves into drunken rambling and hollering. Which, if that isn't your jam, I don't blame you one bit. My shame at having to edit this sober was ample punishment for my sins, and I've learned my lesson at least for the next few months. Cleveland seemed to find it funny, though, so the episode is here to do with it what you will. But whether you enjoy it or not, we here at the Pod People want to wish you all a happy, trashy holiday. Now, here we go! Wait a minute, let me put some boys up in it. Garbage day? Wait, no! Ah! (laughs) (laughs) Fucking, uh, it's us. We're back. Happy Christmas times, Hanukkah times, whatever. It's the holidays. The things are happening. It's cold outside. You're wearing warm clothes. And we're the pod people. I'm... The season's shriekings, Matisse Van Rossum. Punish, punish, punish. I'm Ben Sheets. Man, I was gonna do punish. Ah. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm the the Kwanzaa killer, Cleveland Mosier. And I'm drunk. Wow, the Kwanzaa killer. That's, all I had, That's oh. racist. Hey, hey, all right. <laughs> That's all I had in the moment. <laughs> no offense. I I know literally nothing about Kwanzaa, so. Uh, Y'all are digging yourself a hole, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to edit this out. (laughs) Keep it in. Oh, God. Uh, Make your best judgment, but regardless, I apologize. It's the pod people. I've had... (laughs) Is it now? It's the pod people. I've had had drinks, and we're here to talk... (laughs) Leave that the fuck in. That I know should stay in. Good God. That was amazing. We're here to talk about Silent Night, Deadly Night. <laughs> or at least we're going to try to. Oh, man. I'm, I'm going to say, like, in Tisa's defense, right before we started this podcast, I I watched the film sober, and I I had to make myself a large drink, and I because I knew I, I personally couldn't go into this sober. <laughs> Like so, in in yeah, full defense of of Tease on that one. There's I mean, no it's way. it's the holidays. If there's yeah. if there's a time to you know imbibe um, some fire water. Yeah, pour yourself a big old cup of eggnog. Mm-hmm. Sit back by the fireplace and listen to us talk about these two. Right, you you might be with your family at this point. That's always rough. You definitely got to have some drinks in you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pour yourself a tall um, glass of Christmas. And... Yeah, well, I mean, the pod people are, are a secular podcast, so um, uh, pour yourself a tall glass of holiday juice. Yeah. <laughs> what? Is that just Santa come? It's whatever you want it to be. No, no, because it's... No, 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 no. Yeah. We're, because, we're, because we're a secular podcast mm-hmm. Can't be Santa come. Yeah. Um, Santa is secular. It is holiday juice. <laughs> but drink it in, like Chris Jericho would say. We're we're bringing you some more uh, Yuletide fear, because tis the season <laughs> for the sleazing. Yeah, we're, we're talking the Silent Night, Deadly Night series. We are talking the Silent Night, Deadly Night series. We are talking. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, what a movie. Uh, movies, yes. What, uh, what a movies. Well, we should start with the first one. I mean, as uh, we yeah, do, obviously, uh, you know, because chronology. I was trying to transition us. 
this is a mess. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I think it's the best episode. Let's, we've let's talk about the movie. Let's do uh, it. <laughs> let's try. We've been trying. Let's uh, slowly <laughs> get this sleigh back on on the route. Okay, Ben, tell us about Silent Night, Deadly Night 1. So Silent Night, Deadly Night 1, uh, we start with a kid named Billy, and he's uh, going to see his comatose grandpa. Oh my god, yeah. In the, in two hours away with his parents in the side Well, board. at least two hours yeah. away. On Christmas Eve. So what is it with uh, Christmas horror movies and uh, killers named Billy? What is that? Because in Black Christmas, which we talked about on our Christmas episode last year. Oh, they just copied Black Christmas. The killer, oh, and you're probably right. They did just straight up copy Black Christmas. Um, a far superior film. When did that film come out? Uh, 74. Oh, okay. But yeah, so he goes to see his comatose grandpa uh who's just like uh he's more catatonic than comatose i would say he's kind of just sitting in the chair not moving not saying anything until and of course you know the second the parents leave the room to discuss uh something with the doctor well, yeah they're, they're just like like billy just stay here with grandpa we'll be back in a few minutes we'll just leave you with this old creepy catatonic man and as soon as they do he uh he starts moving yeah. yeah and he uh, turns to the kid and he's like oh santa claus is actually evil if you see santa claus run away he's like christmas is the scariest night of the year cuz santa punishes the bad boys and girls have you been <laughs> bad this year billy, billy? <laughs> you little fuck I like, just like to imagine this uh, this sequence as the ultimate elderly troll. He just plays the long con and pretends to be catatonic just so he can scare the shit out of I, his no, grandkids. That's, what I, that's absolutely what I think is happening here because as soon as the parents come back in, he goes back to being catatonic. <laughs> um, I'm I'm fully convinced that he is completely aware of everything that's happening around him at all times. He's just totally playing everybody, and he just took this opportunity to terrify his poor grandson, mm -hmm. um, who is one of the worst. Worst child actors I've seen in a really long time. It, comically bad at times. Well, yes, I mean it's it, it, char charming, charmingly bad. Well, we should note that there's uh, about three kids that play Billy in this movie. We have a uh, young Billy at the beginning. We have a uh, little older Billy in the middle, and then we have. 20 something well well uh quote unquote 17 year old scare Billy. scare quotes uh 18 year old yeah Billy. yeah um but that dude is way too jacked to be 18 years old and we'll we'll readdress that in silent night deadly night yes too. we will but because silent night deadly night 2 readdressed it so <laughs> well, let's, let's not get too ahead of ourselves after driving many hours to be, see this old man for literally Literally the screen time of five minutes because they leave immediately after this and drive back home. They're driving several hours back home and Billy is uh, expressing some of his newfound fears of Santa Claus and the idea of punishment. And um, we cut to uh, a liquor store being robbed by a by, Santa. by a Santa who uh, shoots a man for thirteen dollars. <laughs> this um, is the smallest amount. Like the the cashier like tried to pull a gun. Well, like, gra granted, this is this is the this is the mid eighties, so thirteen dollars probably would have been more like. $35 back then. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, credit, credit's due. I mean, that's that's a lot of money, man. You know? So uh, he shoots this liquor store clerk uh, for $13, and then we see uh, our family pulling alongside his car that is broken down on the side of the road, and we get a scene of him pulling the gun and shooting the father, and... Um, 
ripping open the mother's shirt for yeah i wanted to talk about that yeah like, i figured i figured you would yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let you take over for like, a second okay so it happens a number of times throughout this film like so maybe should i come back to it like or address it there no, or, by, no by all ahead. means by okay, all means yeah. like this this film like this film's got kind of a habit of glorifying rape a little bit and like i kind of kind of bothered me like there's a good deal as far as as far as i can remember there's only one female character who dies in this movie without her tits out yeah and she's probably in her 40s so that's that's why yeah, yeah. it's it's pretty it's fucking unfortunate. any 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 young woman who dies in this film uh has it has to have her tits out yeah um it it, it feels that's ex- I mean, I mean, I mean, like, I mean, like, that's, to, we have that's to, we, the early 80s for to, you. We have to uh, like, that's yeah. slasher that's like films in the early like, 80s. Like, yeah. I mean, not, yes, not but it's not, to... it's not like a new thing in that, right, in right, that right, genre, right, right, especially yeah. at that time. No, I, I like, agree we should you. take in, into context, not that that makes it okay. Not trying but, to justify it, but it is, it is the, the early to mid 80s and it is a slasher film. Um, so that is not it's what per- you're going to get. It's not particularly yeah. uh, out of out of the zeitgeist of the time. Um, yeah. It does feel particularly sleazy in this movie. It's in pretty poor taste um, a number of times. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you on that, considering the number of 80s slasher films I've seen. This one feels particularly exploitative just because of how much people go out of the way to rip open women's shirts. Yeah, and I mean the cinematography is like pretty pretty keen on it. And it's know? like and it's like look at look at the tits. Yeah, like meanwhile like the the rape is occurring and it's just like why why are you glorifying this? Like yeah, it, it's unfortunate. Uh, but anyway, the, the dad gets killed and the mom gets her shirt ripped open and then gets her throat cut by Santa Claus and Billy runs and hides in the brush on the side of the road and watches as his mother, gets as, as his mother is, is murdered and, uh, important for Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. Um, there is also the baby in the car, the, the infant brother, um, yeah, Ricky key, key word baby. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Like, yeah. like, like. But note on that, like a year old, maybe, like, like an infant, a, a child, an infant child. And then we cut to several years later, and the two have been uh, taken to an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage, a Catholic orphanage run by nuns, and uh, maybe the the worst nuns ever. Um, I no, I, no, <laughs> the nun is the worst nun ever. Is she though? Is she really? I would argue yeah. that the I would argue that the mother superior in this movie yeah, is she, worse than the demon nun in the nun. Mother superior was kind of the nun ratchet of this movie. Um, yeah, so no, to that's, say. that's a you that's are, actually a really excellent comparison. Um, she does have the whole nurse, nurse ratchet vibe going on, and honestly, like. Okay, so we've we've obviously got Billy who becomes the killer later on, but a huge chunk of this movie is just about like the absolute abuse and bullshit that he goes through he, in his childhood. He, he gets the worst given to, to him, the, you to know, the, to the extent, To the extent, worst. well, yeah, exactly. But to the extent that like. I can't even hate him as a villain later in the movie when he snaps for and me, goes on a killing spree. For me, it was the extent that it becomes comedic because it's just yeah. like every chance things could get worse, they do over and over again but, yeah, for but him from, through from this the movie. From the first circumstance on, it, it's from a surreal perspective. Like, the, the grandpa, like reinforcing in this child that Santa Claus is evil before anything has happened but, without uh, any context. Sa- just a couple of hours before a man dressed as Santa Claus murders his parents. <laughs> meanwhile, just, meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, the, the, the grandpa uh, telling him that Santa Claus is evil never gets a 
any payoff whatsoever in the movie. Also, yeah, we never get any context around the evil murdering Santa, like who robs the liquor store. Nah, or he's, kills just his a, he's just a dude who who kills yeah. them. Yeah, I mean the context is him robbing the liquor store. You don't need to know much more than that. Yeah. But like, honestly, I I feel so bad for Billy. Like, even though when we see him again in a few years, the actor that they got for him has the Innsmouth look. And, uh, um, very fishy a, mouth. A, How old is that kid? Is I mean, he's got it. Well, okay, so he's seven years older than the infant. <laughs> um, I'm actually trying to f- do maths here. He's don't, gotta, don't do math for this movie. He, he's got it. Well, it's just, okay, just a ballpark he's, he's got to be like 13 or 14. Here, wait, wait, is the Innsmouth one? Yeah, well, I mean, old? I mean, just, just considering. The age difference between him and the brother, he's got to yeah. be. He's a wee lad. He's a wee lad. And um, the the Innsmouth boy um, uh, with his widespread eyes and big, big, old fish big, big sumptuous lips. Mm-hmm. Um, and he just... Don't describe him as sumptuous. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm putting my foot down. <laughs> but he is he is absolutely horribly abused. Well, the, by, the, by the, the mother. Superior. The first thing we see is obviously he's fucked up by seeing his parents killed by Santa Claus. Yeah, like understandably. So, so, so when Christmas rolls around, obviously he's gonna draw a picture of. Santa Claus being killed. Yeah. Uh, I believe by candy canes too, if I remember yeah. that correctly, yeah. which is such a great detail. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, they hold on that picture for such a short span of time. Yeah. Um, but the teacher is shocked, as well as the rest of the class or whatever. So he gets sent to the uh, Mother Superior. Uh, Nun Ratched. And she's like, You must be punished. And uh, she gets all pissed off at him. Yeah. And that's kind of a theme throughout this section of the movie is just the Nurse Ratched just horribly abusing this kid. Yeah, and being ab- absolutely. The biggest bitch. Um, well, like, she's, she sends him to his room, and then the, the kindly nun, Sister Mary, comes to him. And is like, oh, why don't you come out and build the snowman with us? Like, you've been, you've been locked up in your room long enough. And he comes out, and he hears some strange noises, and wanders down the hall, and looks through a keyhole, and inexplicably finds a couple of people banging in this orphanage. Yeah, you know, nothing turns me on more than just orphanages. Well, like, (laughs) why? Also, like... Like, these are two adult people, like, in this orphanage, like, in a In a Catholic orphanage. Well, right, who who are these people in this orphanage fucking in in a closet? Like, why are they here? Why are they banging? But he sees it, and Mother Superior catches him, um, and then she beats the two people having sex... The the two adult Adult. people... (laughs) Um, she beats them with a belt, and then they're gone from the movie forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she beats Lil Billy uh, for watching them fuck. Uh, and then afterwards... Just instilling in his mind that sex is bad and punishment well, is she, good. Yeah, at the same time, she tells him that like punishment is just and punishment is good. So she's instilling in this child's mind that it's good to be punished for being naughty. And then, uh, inexplicably afterwards, we see her dragging him to a Santa Claus's lap when he obviously doesn't want to sit on oh, Santa's lap for good reason. Um, it's and like- she's and she's like dragging him through a room full of children, like you will be gracious to Santa Claus. And then he just punches the shit out of the Santa. Beautiful which is, knockout which is, punch. It's a great moment. It's, it's my really favorite great. shot, it's, I think, in the first movie. It's, it's like, a little it's, blood it's this, out of his nose, it's too. It's like, like, like yeah. this 12-year-old kid like who just socks the fuck out of this adult man. Like, And yeah. it's just... And the guy goes flying. Like it's it's a great shot. Like, like it, it was. What the fuck is wrong like, with that kid? Uh, do, do we do we run it again afterwards? Like I think so. I think we did. Like it was it was excellent. It was it was fantastic. It's a good punch. He lands a solid punch. Yeah. 
the the scene is made a little more depressing because immediately afterwards he runs up to his room in the corner and just uh, curls up in a ball and is like, uh, "I'm sorry, I was naughty. Uh, please don't punish me." And we we yeah. get a freeze frame on him before he was uh, inevitably beaten again by this god awful nun. It's like that's that's why I have a hard time thinking of Billy as like a villain in this movie because he's just in the first like 30 minutes just set up to have the absolute worst childhood like he witnessed his parents being murdered by a man dressed as santa claus and then he's just mercilessly beaten by uh, an, uh, a mean old nun for things that are legitimately not his fault. And oh, surprise, he has psychological issues when he becomes an adult. Yeah, I, I You know, like, what the <laughs> fuck? I, I would have, uh, I think the reason that I feel so much sympathy for Billy is because I, I felt like I was being abused by the writers because they were beating me over the head with how right. much they wanted to establish this theme. It's, it's like, honestly, I feel like, I feel like Silent Night, Deadly Night is an excellent example of, uh... Overbaking? Of, well, I mean, yeah, but also, like, adequately, uh, depicting PTSD from childhood abuse. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it makes it kind of comical at the same I, time, well, you mean, know, it like, does. It's just because so it's so the 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 amount of coincidences to put him in these bad situations just gets yeah. so ridiculous. Well, I agree well, with that. okay, I, I think, okay, like, that it so becomes funny, and I'm I'm very it. down once, for it because once, it's very good. But once he's an adult, yes, but as a child. He has very little agency over what's happening to him. Yes, but, yeah. But then we, we jump forward in time to when he is supposedly 18, when it's obviously a man in his mid-20s, a uh, very, very jacked man, like s strong boy, um, farm farm boy, uh, we can say. And the, the, the kindly nun gets him a job at this toy store, uh, and we have this absolutely just fantastic, heartwarming montage of him uh, lifting boxes and straightening displays and just like, you know, good, wholesome, yuletide cheer. You know, Tease, I just, I can't remember the, Can you, how the song the went song? during that montage. Okay, could could no, you remind me? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, mm, how did that song go? Yeah. Uh, it probably went something like, It's always Christmas on the warm side of the door. It was such. Uh, it's it's a great song. Such an incredible montage. It it's goes on like, for a really long time. It's, it's an a, American classic, and he's well, just doing the most mundane stuff. It's it's truly it's truly so wholesome. There's like shit like a uh, like a uh, a doll is knocked over on a display, and he straightens it, and it cuts to the owner of the shop like nodding approvingly, with his hands on like, his hips, with his and hands stuff. on his hips. <laughs> like it's so it's so fucking wholesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that like his supervisor like offering him like a shot of JMO and, and he like holds he shakes up his a, head and he, he, has he shakes milk. his head and holds up yeah. a milk box and's like, no, 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 I don't drink, I only drink milk. Like it's like, look at this, look at this wholesome big hossy farm boy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's, it's so funny. <laughs> Oh God! Yeah. Well, honestly, the the music throughout this movie it seemed to have all been made specifically for the movie, oh, yeah. and there were multiple like unique Christmas songs. I could say, I guess, like you got the uh, "Warm Side of the Door," of course, a classic. I don't. Also, I. I need to specify. I don't know what that means. Yeah. What is? The, it's always it's always Christmas on the warm side of the door. Yeah. So if you're on the cold side of the door, fuck you. What does that mean? Like it's not Christmas for you. Like also, hey, you're on the cold. Get, also, get de depending on what part of the country you live in, and this is this takes place in Utah. We should we should mention mm -hmm. that. Um, 
sometimes it's it's cold at times other than Christmas. Sometimes it's warm on both sides of the door. Yeah, sometimes it's warm on both sides of the door, and sometimes it's cold in, like, February. And if it's warm inside, does that mean that it's Christmas on the warm side of the door in February, even though it's not Christmas time? It doesn't... The song doesn't make sense, is what I'm saying. <laughs> That's that the point that I'm trying to make. Is that It's a great song. It's really good. Like I've listened to it like ten times since we watched this movie. It's a fucking fantastic song. Wait, wait. Are you, have you just been like listening to this song? Like... <laughs> uh, it's, it's a called, good it's it, called feeding your bit it's a good it, the point is it's a good song the point is it's a good song and i love it and it's maybe my favorite part of this movie because i've been playing it non-stop like, I, well know, i mean i think put it in every every summer playlist it's every all, winter playlist it's always you name it. it's always christmas on the warm side yeah, of the door always doesn't matter what time of year it is if one side of the door is warm then it's christmas on that side of the door on so, the other side of the door it's not it's, fucking christmas yeah, it's, it's obviously fuck, garbage fuck day. that side of the door it's garbage day on that side of the door and we'll get back to that later on big old footnote then we then we get to uh, a point where uh they need a new santa claus um so for some reason they make billy the new santa claus do you guys remember the reason why the original santa claus couldn't make it he was sick or something what was it ben i legitimately can't remember i was trying to remember i think he it was, was he was sick or he like was sick or he hurt himself or he pulled his back or something i don't know i'm not gonna exert myself for this so the the, the toy the toy store <laughs> family didn't... guy killed or something the the toy store didn't have a Santa Claus, so they decided to uh, make the 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 strong farm boy whose family was murdered by a Santa Claus. They decided to make him the new Santa Claus, and we get this really great scene of a little girl sitting on his lap, squirming <laughs> away, trying to free herself, and he's just like death gripping her, being like, "You're being very naughty right now." Why are you being so naughty? Sit still and be good. Santa punishes those Santa who are naughty severely. It's it's <laughs> weird. It's creepy. It's I, really un- it I, made me really uncomfortable. I hated it. It has a weird rapey vibe yeah, to it. This this whole film has got like um, a problem with that. Yeah, like. Uh, the the funny part though is you get a cut to the parents who are standing like right well, next to it, yeah. and she's like, uh, the like the mom is like, he's such a good Santa, he's so good, he just with the knows kids. how to work with the kids. He's so good, I mean, and uh, I as think as, that was pretty funny. as uh, he gives uh, the the daughter a candy cane and lets her go, she's like horrified and just mortified next to her mom. And her mom's like, "This is a great Santa Claus. You should have this guy every year." And uh, you get a shot of the the manager just off to the side, being like, "Yeah, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's he's good." I did a good job picking this. And and after the store closes, uh, they have a, a staff Christmas party in the empty store uh, where the express purpose of it is to get shit-faced, as the owner of the store says. So they do. Which so, is usually the way for a good Christmas party. I mean, yeah, like, at every place I've ever worked have been shit-faced at staff Christmas party. Like, yes, uh, it is the way to do it. But uh, his his love interest, this, this girl who works at the store, um, she seems to be more interested in this other guy, or maybe not maybe he's just particularly rapey uh, can, can we just talk about dude like this this other guy is is the ultimate like italian stereotype oh yeah dude. he's mm-hmm. such a fucking like Guido. he's got the italian leather boots on like he's got the slick back hair he's got his, the attitude his pants like, are pulled up just below his nipples oh yeah <laughs> uh, he's fashion like yeah this guy, like, like there, there are a number of occurrences, both in the first and second film, where these their characters look like they just walked off the set of Grease. Also, he like, has he has such a big beef with Billy 
uh, earlier in the movie for absolutely no reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, I'm going to report you to the manager. He's like, he's like why, are, why are you being so moody, Billy? Why are you acting so straight? It's like, oh, maybe it's because the holiday season is hard for this, this poor kid whose family was murdered by a Santa Claus and who has been beaten senseless all of his life by a nun during the holiday season. Maybe he has a hard time with this time of year but uh oh no why are you so moody billy i i'm gonna report you to mr what's his face you little you, dipshit you little piece of shit um and then he tries to to rape billy's love interest in the back room and again, yeah it, it they yeah. well yeah they they have to they have to rip her tits out of course it's um, horrid she's wearing a cardigan and he rips it open and of course she's not wearing anything under the cardigan um so they have to have her tits out um and then billy comes in uh with his insane farm boy strength and uh wraps some christmas lights around the dude's throat and lifts him up with one hand and strangles him to death and <laughs> which is one of my favorite things about this movie is they never like like don't get me wrong billy is jacked but they, he's not that jacked. Like he's but not they, jacked enough for like a superhuman like level. But that's the thing. He, he's yeah, got they, that. Both he uh, and his brother. That a uh, country boy. Like like strange. Neither, so to say. Yeah. Like yeah, <laughs> quotations around that. Like, but but yet yeah, it's it's never explained why either Billy or his brother have this like superhuman degree of strength that they they display several times throughout the film intentionally. I mean, I I I, I, I just I just strength? I just gather that uh, orphanages are like prisons where all you do for recreation is just Manual work labor, out, <laughs> just yeah. work out. You know, you become jacked just like we, in prison. <laughs> There's like a little Muslim brotherhood in the prison. We, <laughs> like, we never we never saw the mine out back of the orphanage <laughs> where they were where they were digging up coal that's why they, they come out of the orphanage so fucking jacked um and but the, the confusing thing is after he saves uh his love interest from being raped um he then immediately murders her with a box cutter because um, he's gotta you know become santa and because uh because Punish. Yeah. Um, um, and that's all that needs to be well, said on that. Yeah, when, when the dude was killed, I was almost ex excited because I was like, oh, we're getting a, like a rape revenge thing. Right, right. Well, I mean, that's what you would think naturally. Um, but then he disembowels his, his love interest with a box cutter. And it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, Billy. <laughs> Slow down, man. All right. Um, and then he kills everybody else in the store. Goes well, full he, Rambo, yeah. He, he smashes his boss his boss's head in with a hammer. All pain hammer. And then, and then the uh, the other woman, um, who's she, she gets the best of him yeah. for a moment by throwing some boxes on him. And then she's about to, she takes a baseball bat or something. She's about to smash one of the windows. And he's like, no! And, and we, he, we and turn we, around and he has a, <laughs> <laughs> he has a full bow. Like a and he's just bow. shooting a Christmas <laughs> arrow into her chest. Like, like no context. We don't see where the bow was before. No. She she just, she's just she's like, running from him. Like the camera like sticks on her for a good while as she's running through the shop and she's like looking for an escape and she's about to hit the window and then that's when Billy behind her just shouts no and and for whatever reason instead of just still continuing to try to escape this woman actually stops and turns and turns and looks at him yeah and we and cut to him and he just has a bow and arrow inexplicably we never saw him pick this up ever, ever. Yeah, totally random uh, and he just fires the arrow and just kills the shit out of her and it's awesome it's, um, very, it's very it's funny, so honestly. I'm not, I'm not holding it against like, the movie. Like, I uh, wonder how much self-awareness went into that because it feels like it was a little self-aware. Um, not in a bad way, but come on. That is so good and so over the oh, top. Oh, it's fucking that, hilarious. 
Yeah, they they had to have known. Mm-hmm. Come on, I mean, it is amazing though. It is hilarious. Well, and then uh, the story devolves, and Billy just goes on a murder rampage. Just a just a, a murder rampage. A Christmas killing. He is he's still dressed as Santa Claus. Uh, important important to uh, qualify. This is a Christmas horror film. He he breaks into to some poor girl's house as she's about to have sex with her boyfriend um and uh puts her up on a uh, taxidermy deer's rack just stabs the shit out of her again her tits are out her i mean yeah her tits are her tits are way out um for sure unfortunate um, i thought it was super funny how uh billy Bust through the door. It is, oh, yeah, in. Kool-Aid Man style. Yeah. He does, the fake he does door. Bust, he fake. does bust through her fake door, Kool-Aid Man style. <laughs> Which um, is amazing. Meanwhile, her boyfriend is downstairs in the basement playing pool by himself. Uh, listening to music, he's like, hey, what's going on up there? As, as Billy she doesn't is, hear, like, the murder scream. Bill, yeah, as Billy <laughs> is upstairs, like, throwing his axe at her and, like, stabbing her up on like a like a a mounted deer's head yeah, the the people in the characters in these both of these films make like video game ai look like genius technology right like so you know, what's going on up there my yeah. my favorite part is when the boyfriend comes up to investigate he he goes into the room oh, yeah. where the girlfriend is and is like uh, if you're if you're playing a joke on me, I'm gonna be very mad. And then he turns, and she's like right there next to him. Well, yeah, on, he, wa- where, he where walks. He walks. He, he could have not seen her. Like like he walks into the room, <laughs> and she's she's right in the center. Okay, like okay. To to describe it to the, the to the listeners, there's the back wall of the room, which the door is against. And he walks in like where uh with the back wall of the room just to the right of him. And she's on that back wall. Like, if he walked in the doorway, she would have been the first thing he would have seen. There's no way. There's no way he wouldn't have seen her. At all. There's no way. There's and, no and he, way. he walks in. And it's like, you, you could have faked the shot. There's so many other ways you could have worked around it. And it would have been a problem. But, like, we have to see him walk into the room, like, where he could have only seen her. And see her, her legs dangling in yeah. the background behind him before he turns around. Um, and then Billy throws him out of a window and he gets impaled on some glass. Like, like the guy has to walk around her to turn around and see her. And then we, and then we get a great scene where Billy wanders off into the woods, uh, and there's a couple of kids who are going to go sledding and some bullies show up and steal their and sleds. steal their sleds from them uh, to go down this sweet virgin hill that has very obviously had lots of people on it. Like the whole it's camera the crew least and everybody. It's steep hill, though. And it's, it's and like, yeah, it's like the shallowest hill. By the like, end of it, they shallow- have to like push themselves down. Well, that's, so. that's the funniest <laughs> shit is like they're talking about like it's a sweet hill and we see them sledding down it. It, and it's such a shallow hill that they're like pushing themselves <laughs> down it with their arms. <laughs> it's such a shallow uh, It's slope. incredible. And Billy chops off their. Uh, one of them is sliding down the hill, and Billy just steps out into the way and chops off his head. Uh, and it's fucking yeah. awesome. And we yeah. see the head roll down the 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 hill, along it, with the the sled with the decapitated body. It's awesome. Well, one thing uh, you forgot to mention right before that is the cops uh, hear that there is a killer Santa on the oh, loose. Oh, yes. How can I forget the, So this? they obviously are on the lookout for a Santa, and they see a Santa Claus going into a, a house through a, on a ladder through yeah. a window. <clears throat> and so they immediately rush over... And just bust in, guns blazing, and just bust into uh, the room where the Santa is coming in. And it turns out to be uh, just a dad uh, trying to surprise his kid. Yeah. And he just, just... Just a father going in through his child's window to leave some presents dressed as Santa. <laughs> and the cops just bust in. But... 
in this scene they don't they don't shoot this Santa, which is important for what happens Next. shortly hereafter when they determine that Billy is surely going back to the orphanage where he grew up, and a cop pulls up and sees a Santa walking up to the orphanage with all the kids, and they're like, "Oh yeah, Santa!" And the cop just gets out of his car and just unloads his entire clip right into the Santa Claus's back, right in front of a bunch just of right kids. In front of like, just right in front of like 40 children and then they realize that oh man this Santa was fucking like Father Kelly the pr- the deaf priest who was unarmed and who just, didn't just, hear that he should stand down yeah, who, you know? didn't hear the co- who didn't hear the cop behind him who's dressed as Santa trying to surprise this ch- these children so this cop just murdered this unarmed deaf priest I just love how the cops are consistently <laughs> ruining Christmas in this movie it's so good it's so good they ruin Christmas for maybe 40 to 50 kids in this movie just over and over and we get this whole long sequence of the cop who shot the the non-killer santa going around the orphanage every corner he comes around he pulls his gun dramatically he goes into the it's shed. like the the jump and squat move yeah the jump and squat. he goes <laughs> but, down and to it's, the... it's really unfortunate because this cop looks like ned flanders and, he does. and, and you, you <laughs> yeah. can tell that the actor thinks he's fucking rambo like it it's very displaced. It's very good, and, honestly. And hilarious. For I I'm I'm very much for it. Like he, he does that classic cop stance every yeah, time the, he goes the, around the corner. The the, the wide legged squat with yeah, his gun with out, both, both hands, hands on the gun. It's it's yeah. incredible. And he well, there's this whole scene with like the shed, like the creepy shed, where he's like, oh yeah, surely the killer's in there, and he goes down to the basement and he's like looking around it's like oh there's nothing there and he's coming back up the stairs and right when he gets back to the entrance billy pops out he's like punish <laughs> and he just drives the axe into dude's chest and he just tumbles down the stairs after all of this shit and then the fucking mother superior who's now in a wheelchair is like inside with all of the kids they're like singing Christmas carols to to try to distract them, and a Santa walks up to the door, and one of the kids runs and lets them in, and we see it's Billy, and he's coming in with his axe, and for no reason, this fucking bitch of a nun who we've seen throughout the entire movie beating these children with a belt just start shouting there is no Santa Claus there is no Santa Claus the worst part is immediately after that happens uh right as he's about to swing down the axe and kill mother superior uh Billy is shot several times in the back by a cop Yep, who um, comes in after him. Yeah, so uh, obviously the cop was there yeah. while Mother Superior was yelling she, this the no, whole she time. Definitely, she definitely would have seen him and decided to still ruin the magic of Christmas for all of these children and just start screaming, there is no Santa Claus for no reason. In the biggest what did, nurse ratchet what is What did she think would happen? Did she think if she said there was no Santa Claus, Billy would be like, you're right. There is no Santa Claus. And he would just disintegrate and disappear into the ether. Like, what, what the fuck did she expect was going to happen? Just rips off all of his Santa gear. and Like, honestly, and, and I mean, that's, walks out. That's, that's the end of the movie. Uh, well, I mean, we see we see his brother. They they zoom in on him and he's like, punish. Yeah, he, he's like right at the the foot of the dead Billy. I think. Yeah. Right? And they they pan up to him and he's obviously shocked. Yeah, he's And that like, takes us into the, the second the, the movie. The second one, which 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 we'll get into here in a second. But uh like honestly, Billy is such a sympathetic character as far as I'm concerned. Like, yeah, he kills a bunch of people, but like that is a damaged fucking child. Like 
nobody was doing that poor kid any fucking favors. And then they're all shocked when he goes on a fucking killing spree. Yeah, and it's, like, it's weird, too, because, like, the film almost sort of expects you to be shocked over it. That was sort of the, the part that kind of threw me a little bit. Like, the... The, the film, like, sets up all these these obscure occurrences around Billy to build Billy's trauma that could never have happened in any any legitimate chain of events. And then they expect you to be like, surprised it's, it's by truly, it. It's truly so specific, like, what yeah. what has happened to him. Like, almost like it like had to have fact, been written. Like, the, fact, <laughs> right, the fact that he's... That his, that his trauma is triggered not only by Santa Claus, but also, like, any sexual act because he watched the 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 dude dress as Santa like rip his mom's titties out of her shirt. So so his 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 rage is very specifically triggered by both titties. but by both Christmas and titties. But also <laughs> like he spent he spent his entire childhood being like mercilessly beaten by nuns for no reason who were like super unsympathetic to the shit that he'd been through like i can't hate billy like that's the thing like i can't i can't be mad at him at all he's such a sympathetic killer because like his his whole childhood is terrible like this poor kid like his whole life has just been building up to this fucking breaking point when he finally went crazy and killed everybody like why is anybody surprised that this happened and and the way it's presented is just such a string of just almost comically horrendous uh, right. occurrence coincidence after coincidence you know well have have we also we also haven't mentioned that uh in the house where he kills the girl and her boyfriend where he breaks in there are um several exquisite tiger paintings oh yeah we didn't mention those those, those are, are exquisite very very good just paintings of just majestic tigers. I think I think one or two of them is a tapestry actually um, like they're like yeah, woven. like well they're 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 very big paintings. Yeah, it's about as 80s as it's it like, gets. Well, there's, just like there's, this like Bengal tiger painting in your like house with in, the There's like one in there's like one in the basement over the pool table. We're like, whoa, look at that fucking dope ass tiger painting. And then like the girlfriend goes upstairs and she's like walking through the living room and like there's another tiger painting. Yeah, yeah they're awesome. just kitschy yeah, that, as hell, but the I'm house here has for multiple it. Multiple tiger paintings in it. It's excellent. Nothing like a house with a pool table, some tiger paintings, and a giant moose head. But yeah, so this movie Poor is, Billy. Is yeah, the point. poor Billy. I have a, a few notes of trivia I want to give to you guys about Get this that movie. Shit out, uh, before we go to ratings. Uh, so the original uh, title for this movie... Uh, was not Silent Night, Deadly Night. It was, oh. in fact, a uh, Sleigh Ride. Was it spelled S-L-A-Y yes. Ride? Yes, yes, absolutely. Ride? Excellent, of course. And in addition... That's uh, actually kind of a better title, if, I, if, if I'm being honest. Also, this movie came out to a huge amount of controversy when it was originally released. Oh, shit. Because, you know, the trailers showed Santa with an axe. You know, with an as an axe murder, and oh, all the, the violence they had a problem with. Okay, well, well it was the eighties. They obviously didn't have a problem with the titties. Yeah, um, and this was you know eighty four, right at Reagan reelection, where like all of the super conservative family movements were going on, and they were like, "Oh, you're destroying the kids," you know. You're ruining the kids. The children and the titties. Even, uh, even I think uh, Gene Siskel of uh, Siskel and Ebert uh, on his uh, show protested the film uh, on the show Boo. by uh, reading the names of the companies that own the distributor TriStar Pictures that released this film. That's petty as fuck. Uh, on the show, Jesus and then said, God. "Shame on you." Gene, it's a pretty good advertisement. You have nothing real. to be proud of. Like Gene, like Gene. It's a, that's a hell of an ad. I mean, yeah, I guess so. You, know, you couldn't pay for a TV spot like that. And it's a dry sand effect, like in. That is a good point because when this was released, it was released up against the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie. 
Uh, and want to come out the same year. Yeah. Yep. Holy and holy shit! Wow. And for its opening weekend, this uh, outgrossed Nightmare on Elm Street. What? Are you kidding? Wow. Yeah. That's insane because Nightmare on Elm Street is a wildly better film than this. Yeah. <laughs> like, like um, we, I, I'm not even gonna begin to get into how well, much of a better. Film we we than should Nightmare note that this movie came out in <laughs> twice as many theaters as Nightmare on Elm Street. Holy shit! You're blowing my mind right now. That's that's honestly honestly that's. That's complete insanity. Like this is a, it, it, this it's is, kids play to try and compare the a, two. This is a fun little schlocky movie, but like compared to the original Nightmare on Elm Street, that is absolute insanity. Yeah, that that really blew my mind. So uh, one last thing, uh, the uh, one of the biggest uh, critics of this movie when it was coming out uh, was uh, Mickey Rooney, the actor. Weird. <laughs> um, he was all over the media saying how awful this was to have Santa as an axe murder <laughs> in a major movie coming out. What a buzzkill. And, kill. you know, showing it all over the media with trailers and whatnot. A lot of trailers were pulled from the air because, you know, Santa as an axe murder, maybe not the best to show for kids. But <laughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night 5... Guess who made an appearance? No shit. Was it Mickey Rooney? Yeah, Mickey oh! Rooney was in Silent Night, Deadly Night 5. <laughs> That's awesome. So he went That's full so circle funny. on it by the end. Holy um, shit. Which I thought is very good. All right, boys, let's rate the fuck out of this. Yeah. Um, I'll, I guess I'll start. This is a fun movie. It's not incredible. It's pretty fucking stupid in a lot of ways, but I laughed many times. Um, it's a, it's a good, fun, schlocky, holiday horror classic. Uh, I'm gonna give it a three and a half out of five pods. Uh, I found this film to be pretty tasteless. Uh, and like, I did <laughs> laugh, I did laugh a couple of times, always at the film, of course. Um, and, uh, generally I'd be more forgiving, you know, falling back to like the, the ginger dead man and whatnot, like with our ironic ratings. Um, but with this film, uh, some of the, the tastelessness kind of ugh, kind of makes that very difficult for me to give it any kind of ironic rating. I'm giving it a 1.5. Oh, Jesus Oh, no, sheesh. I'm going okay. I was, I was not. Well, I, was not I, I very much disagree with you, Cleve. Uh, I, you, you probably were one of the, the parents, uh, you know, protesting this movie. No, I mean, uh, you know, like for very different reasons, like the, the yeah. violence I could give a shit about, but. You know, the, you know, it is trashy. The, the you know, it's, it's definitely trashy at times. Uh, uh, but that's nothing new in movies from the 70s or 80s, especially exploitation movies. It's a whole genre yeah. of horror movies. Well, I'm not going to lower my rating because it came out but, in the 80s. But you gave this a lower rating than Ginger Dead Man 2. That's uh, <laughs> that's surprising to me. But I won't, hey, I won't argue Wait, what, what did I give Ginger Dead Man 2? We all gave it a unanimous two out of five. Two? Yeah. Hey, hey no, oh, yeah, no <laughs> changing it now. No, no changing. Bucko. You, you, you done said it. You, know, I mean, you done I, fucked up. I, I'll, I'll still stick with it. I mean, like, if, if I have any regret, it's probably giving Ginger Dead Man 2 a two. I mean, <laughs> like, it, it's not it's not raising my rating for this film. So, see, so no. No, I, I'll stand by see, it. See, I, I think this movie is a wonderfully trashy movie. I don't think it glorifies rape. It definitely has some rape in it but I don't think it necessarily glorifies it so it didn't it bother me as much I don't think it does it, like it's not shown as a good thing by any means but I think this movie was hella entertaining it was very fun to watch the kills were surprisingly creative um, I'll agree with that. and yeah. uh, oftentimes very over the top um, it had some fucking musical bops, especially the. It's always Christmas on the warm side of the door. Exactly. No, thank you for that. I I needed that cue. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that see that song is incredible. There were other songs that were very <laughs> funny in this. This whole movie was as a comedy, it worked amazingly, and as a horror movie, I don't even think it was that bad either. Unlike most horror movies, we actually really sympathize with Billy. 
um, which is kind of unique for horror movies, especially horror movie villains. But I thought that kind of gave it a unique perspective. Um, I thought it was a really solid movie and a lot of fun, a lot of fun. So I'm going to give it a three and a half out of five, too. So check it out. Yeah. Well, uh, that'll give uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night a 2.8 out of 5 pods. Um, I, I think it's I think it's a it's a fun trashy holiday movie. It's definitely not incredible, but uh, it has some fun stuff in it and some some good good laughs, I think. Yeah, it's a good movie to watch late night when you're a little drunk off the eggnog. Truth. Definitely good for a uh, if, if you're if Worth you're looking for a, if you're looking for a solid Christmas B movie. I mean, B horror movie. I would say just skip to Silent Night, Deadly Night too. It is a thing. These these films are very weirdly tied together. That's yeah, pro- that's probably strange because like it's a sequel, but like, I want to talk about the backstory. Of yeah, this a why don't bit. why don't why don't you ease us into that, Ben? Because this is something that Cleveland and I did not know going into this film. I think this is a good transition into the. So, the second uh, this movie is directed by Lee Harry, I believe his name was. Yeah. Um, and he had just won an Oscar, actually, an Academy Award for his student film. And so uh, he got his first offer to direct a theatrical feature film, and it was Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2. Uh, so obviously, what are you going to do? Obviously, you're going to fucking sign to do a theatrical release, you know? I mean, Big yeah, movie. Like, like you do. If you're a student and you, you get an Oscar for a fucking student film, yeah, you're going to fucking take whatever is thrown at you. Absolutely. Especially, you know, to a movie that beat out Nightmare on Elm Street in the box office. Still cannot believe that. That's still rocking my um, fucking world. It's crazy. My, my nips have been blown against the goddamn wall. <laughs> yeah, but apparently... Uh, the producers of Silent Night, Deadly Night Part 2 wanted to, instead of actually shooting a movie, just re-edit the footage, all of the footage from the first one, and call it a new movie. Which makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Nah, it's highway robbery, as far as I'm concerned. Like, well, yeah, like, surely, like but- Oh, yeah, well, like, you know, like, let's, let's, uh, for all the audiences that wanted to go in and see a sequel film, uh, why don't we just show them the first film again, but reordered? What? But like, it's like, like I- Like, could you imagine sitting down, like, like, paying money to see this film and, and seeing just the same film re-edited? Like, I would, I would be well, furious. Well, that was, that was very much my feeling sitting down to watch this film. Same, uh, just, same. Just considering that, like, the first 30 minutes of this movie is uh, 90% just the first movie cut down. Yeah, so the director, you know, refused to uh, just re-edit the movie and demanded to, you know, make a new movie. Because it's a fucking sequel. That's well, what like, that's, you do. That's 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 my ultimate question. Before we get into it too much, is like, what were the producers thinking? Like, I'm having a really hard time like wrapping my brain around what their intention was to just take the footage from the first film and re-edit it slightly and slap the number two on it and call it a sequel to Silent Night, Deadly Night. Like, what what was their intention? Like, that is legitimately baffling to me because I don't understand what they were thinking. They weren't. Like, I mean, really is the answer. I mean, I, I, think, I think you must be right, but it's like I'm legitimately trying to figure out, like, what, not even from a filmmaking standpoint, but from a business standpoint... Like, what was the goal there? What was the intention? How did they look at that and be like, oh, yeah, we're just going to make money off of re-editing the same footage yeah, so- into another film that's exactly the same thing? Oh, money again. What is the actual intention behind that? So, so apparently, apparently the uh, producers wanted to insert just one to two scenes with Eric Freeman playing a mental patient. To make the story of the original film appear to be nothing more than a ra- the ravings of an asylum inmate, which oh would be 
disastrous. I mean, which it basically is, but at least they expanded on it. At least fucking Lee Harry did something. I mean... Yeah, I I mean, instead of having 95% of the same film, I think this movie only had... Uh, I, I was looking at the thing here. It says uh, it only has 25 minutes of archival footage, which is a lot. Don't get me well, wrong. I mean, it's a I, lot. I mean, yeah. also, like, a lot of it is... I mean, let, let's just be real. Like, the first 25 minutes of the movie, or we'll say 30 minutes to incorporate that 25 minutes of archival footage... It is just the first movie like, with the shots all cut down, which is just to say that you could take the original 80-ish minute movie and trim a few seconds off of each shot and cut the entire thing down and, to 25 minutes. And the thing about that, too, like my, my additional point on that, is that the original film was probably about 25 minutes long of content anyway. Like they 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 hold out on so many shots. They they run the runtime out as long as they can, regardless. With the the first movie, just to try and pad out like a two hour run. Well, yeah. well, I mean, there, so, there's so a lot you, of when things. When you cut it down, you get an actual movie length out of it. So I think that honestly, you. I, I feel like you could just skip the first film and just watch the second one and get the full plot well, and context. I, I of think the there first are movie. a lot. Kind of, I kind of like like the, honest, the, the, the like... second film like includes so many like sequences from the first movie that that have no relevance to the core plot line even like yeah like they I mean, include a lot of like the extra there are kill a lot sequences of... and so many things that like the main character wasn't even there to recount. Like, like for the for the sake of the plot, just to well, run I mean that, that film's for, plot for, time. There for are context. a lot of great moments from the first movie that you know I would almost say kind of warrant a watch. Whether it's uh, the the bop of a song or the grandpa yeah, insane, you know that watching the first one isn't not worthwhile. But this is a unique movie in that you can watch the second one on its own and not be super confused because it spells out all of what happened in the I first would say, movie. Oh, yeah, I would say you lose very little from the first movie and watching the second one. You, you like, definitely yeah, don't it, lose anything you acquire. It, it, Good it, God. It cuts, out, it cuts out a few particularly fun moments. Um, the montage of Billy working in the store with that crazy, excellent song is a good example of that. But, I mean, it hits all of the plot points. And I mean, it's supposed to be a, a doctor interviewing the infant from the first movie, Billy's little brother. Returning to that footnote. Re- yeah, returning to that footnote, he describes all of the shit that happens at the beginning with his parents being murdered. No way he would have remembered that because he was maybe a year old, if that. There's no way he would have remembered that shit. But it's just him recounting all of the events of the first one, including stuff that he would not have seen, nor would he have been told about. I'm just going to go ahead and say, like, I laughed a lot in this movie, but I I think a, a good encompassing statement is that Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 makes no sense at all ever (laughs) ever 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 there's no part of this movie that makes sense there's no part of this movie that makes any sort of logical sense ever i mean if you're looking for logical sense in a movie called silent night deadly night 2 you're gonna have a bad time but i watched the first one which makes a decent amount of somewhat logical sense at times <laughs> <laughs> credit on that like well, I mean, like the, the, the what okay uh, let, me, sh- let me say a couple of things first like uh first off yes there there are a couple of like fun sequences in the first film that are lost like the montage or whatever else that that they got some laughs out of us but what what i if if you're going i think that honestly the latter half all of the new sequences in the second film are so great that i would argue it is it is better to watch the second film first and then decide from there if you want to see the first movie like i would actually agree with that yeah yeah, I would. I would say that that is not inaccurate. Like, I think because, that would be the proper way to, like, order the first, to watch these films. Because the first one, the first one gives you uh, everything. Like, like we've plot said, plot wise, everything. Like, and like, then like some. we, like we have said, a solid 
25 minutes of footage from the first film. It's just, it's all the same shit, but the shots are short. They literally took several sequences from the first movie and the shot order is all the same. We should also mention that it's, it keeps being intercut with Eric Freeman, uh, who plays uh, Ricky in this one, being interviewed by this, uh, you know, doctor um, about what happened and his uh, experiences. And Eric Freeman Oh man, he gives awesome. nearly a Nick Cage level performance yeah. in terms of levels of batshit in this movie. I agree. That's actually a really good comparative. I hadn't thought about like yeah. he 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 does share a lot of similar sort of characteristics to to Nick Cage's sort of well. First of all, avant garde levels of weirdness. Well, first of all, let's be real. He he looks straight up like a young Vince McMahon. There's no working <laughs> around that. He, I, I could not stop seeing it in the entirety of this movie. Is that he looks like a young Vince McMahon? Yeah. And if you're, if you're, he, a wrestling he does look fan, very similar. It's, it's off. It's honestly gonna make the movie way more enjoyable for you because it just looks like a like little baby and, Vince. And for those who who are less familiar with the the wrestling canon, I. I uh, I very thoroughly enjoyed it as well. I just, I just thought that like his his eyebrows move like he's an animatronic. Yeah, puppet. see, his that's, eyebrows that's the insane. that's the big thing that got me. Like I was just focused in on his eyebrows. His eyebrows were just constantly moving They're during epic. this movie. Eyebrows, Freeman. Yeah, yeah. It's it's absolute insanity. Also, we should mention that he's supposed to be like eighteen, nineteen in this movie. <laughs> um. I, I, I had to look it up halfway through the movie because I didn't believe that. He was about 21 when they shot this movie. But he looks mid 30s. But he, but he looks at least like 28, 29, 30 yeah. years old. He's huge. He's jacked. I was amazed it's to just, know he was younger than me. Like, it's younger just, than I am. It's just like Billy in the first one. Like, they're both supposed to be 18 around the time of the these films. They're big fucking boys. Like, just jacked just jacked just boys. huge guy just and huge on boys. top of that in a somewhat similar way as the first one we have not one not two not three but four people playing ricky in this movie <laughs> and my favorite part is they have a scene of him so uh, once he uh leaves the orphanage he's uh uh, adopted by this Jewish family who never celebrates Christmas because the perfect way to, you know, axe that trauma for a while. Because Christmas trauma or whatever, even though he has relatively nothing to do with the first movie, Christmas trauma. <laughs> is is to give him a Jewish family. I, I should mention, slight tangent to my point, but we'll, we'll go on this for just a split second. There's an awesome scene where a young uh, Ricky is with his mom and his mom is like talking to someone and we get this like slow-mo shot of uh, nuns walking down the street and Ricky is just horrified and right when He's he... absolutely <laughs> losing his shit. Yeah, right when he gets his mom's attention, they like turn the corner uh, obviously and she sees nothing and the split second and she turns back to talk again they they <laughs> walk right out of the right out of the store and right into the next one <laughs> like you know as you do you just go in a store for 10 seconds and leave yeah. right. it's not, incredible n- neither of these films know how to people and it's delightful. It's, it's like, so uh, good. Well, it's, this, and, it's, this, film, it's, this film particularly does not It's know very it good, honestly. That's sort of, yeah. that's I'm sort here of the, for it. It's sort but, of the theme of Silent Night, it's, Deadly it's, Night 2. And, and to, it's to make wonderfully too, over the top, like, like, and it's, it's the perfect way to do it yeah, because... Well, one of my favorite examples of it too is the the sequences between Ricky and his his 13th, specified 13th therapist. You could try to use the excuse well of course ricky's insane like he doesn't know how to people 
So, uh, of course, his, the, his dialogue interactions don't make any sense. But the therapists don't either. And... <laughs> Which which just kills that any any grounding to reality for for those dialogue sequences. So when the therapist responds to Ricky, he says things that are totally non uh, tangential as well. Like it, it reminded me of like uh, conversations in like Silent Hill too. Like it, it, there there were just a number of times throughout this movie where where people talk to each other and. They they don't acknowledge what the other person is saying. They just say what their character is supposed to kind of say next. What will like carry us on to the next scene, as opposed to what makes any sense to actually say to another human. Well, uh, a great example is when we we cut to Ricky when he is seventeen, which is another actor, which is a, um, a different a different actor from when he's um, twelve, which. I, we should mention, we should mention in a great section, going back to the point I was going to make, is uh, <laughs> they have two actors from when he's 17 and 18. Yes. I was, and I was gonna, they look I was like gonna, completely different people, and it's amazing. I was, I was gonna it's get hilarious. In, I was going to get into that, but we cut from when he's 12 to when he's 17, and he's taking a stroll through the woods and the fields and whatever, and he sees this couple and this uh, uh, douchey guy tries to rape his girlfriend because she's not... But this time, doesn't show the titties. No titties. Thank God. Um, Like... uh, like, like the film doesn't get the the social interaction right, like uh, of the sequence. I'm, like it's really weird the way that the guy's just like, I'm gonna go get a beer now, and like walks off. But like, well, at well least, okay, like, okay. Well, like the film doesn't like feel the need to like you know like. He's all like, he's all like, tell me you want it. She's like, I want it, just not right now. And he tries to rip her shirt off, and she kicks him in the balls. He's like, all right, I'm gonna go get a beer. But I'll be back to imply that I just tried to rape you, but I'm going to come back in a few minutes and try to rape you again. Yeah. And he Horrible. goes and he goes back to his Jeep mm-hmm. and he he gets a beer and we get a shot of him like walking around the Jeep. It's this amazing he, oneer. It's well, it, it's truly incredible because he leans in the window and he looks around and he sees nothing and he walks around to the front of his Jeep and it pans around and all of a sudden Ricky is in the front seat of his Jeep. He was not there 10 seconds ago, but now he is and he starts up the car and he runs this man over and backs up and runs back over him and backs up and runs back over him over and over again as the girlfriend witnesses as the girlfriend watches and she walks up to him as he gets out of the car and she's like thank you and then walks away. Well, it's it's funny because to to go on to Cleveland's point from the first movie, this is almost a reversal of that True. where where instead of, you know, just rape exploitation, you get kind of rape revenge in a lot of ways with this because you know, the uh predator is getting murdered and instead of having Ricky kill, you know, the victim, the woman, he he just uh lets her go essentially and she says thank you you know right as, right as, she she watches him run over her boyfriend and then says thank you and wanders off into the woods mm-hmm. it makes no sense it is still very much whiplash inducing well yeah you know? for sure it's like well, especially so, yeah. especially because right after this it cuts to a year only one single year later and it's a completely different actor yeah. playing ricky I, it's, before it's, we it's, move on before yeah, yeah. we move on, I want to talk about how much of a country blumpkin the the uh, the, okay. the 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 pig, as he called himself. Uh, you know uh, I'm a pig, baby. <laughs> yeah, and he's just like drinking bush light or whatnot or what whatever he's it drinking, was. He's drinking Tecate. Tecate, yeah, and uh, he's just drunkenly trying to rape his girlfriend of course he has a jeep and like right um it's just so perfect it's really funny i'm glad in a lot of ways that it doesn't go in the exploitation route that you know we were kind of worried about you know coming in from the first one especially you cleveland um it kind of goes in a different direction but oh man he is 
very much a Jeb Bush country bumpkin he's, character. He's a, he's a scuzzy boy for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so we move on to the next scene where it's one year later where he's a, completely, it's, it's a different completely different actor. It's just a completely different actor. It's Eric Freeman now. He's uh, he's inserted himself into the flashback. So it's just Ricky, but in in an entire year, he's become a completely different person and become extremely jacked. Eric Freeman is a uh, huge in this movie. He's a big fucking boy. He's got those fucking. He's got the traps and the delts. He's a big boy. And then we we see he's like working in a restaurant, and some mobster dude is kick is beating up a dude in the back alley, and Eric Freeman just stabs him with an umbrella. Yeah, well, it's a great scene because uh, the uh, the mobster is like uh, to the guy. He's the most Guido mobster right. I've ever seen, right. and he's like. If I see you around this area, I I'm gonna kill you. I hope uh, I hope you don't pay by Monday, cause I like kicking your ass so much. Um, uh, it's just great. And then, uh, obviously Ricky sees this from afar and steps in in the most dramatic, over the top, uh, manner 80s, possible. Very, yeah, very. Uh, I I love how he he goes up to like choke him and he pulls him up like a well, foot pick, and a he, half he picks him up with one hand so we, we he show he shows that he had he has inherited his brother's uh farm boy strength uh that is just absolute insanity for for a human being to have and also he's supposed to be 18 years old but he looks like he looks like he's 30 even though he's only 21 which is baffling to me uh, but w- b- beside the point, he, it was a different time. The eighties. He jams an umbrella through his stomach and opens it on the other side of him, and it's awesome. And then the rain starts tastefully falling once this man has been impaled with an umbrella. Yeah. Well, one thing I want to mention <laughs> is uh, in the psychiatrist scene earlier, uh, they mention uh, he writes down. Red car, really big. Red car! Because the Jeep was red. Right. And, you know, Santa Claus is red. And, uh, uh,. It, the uh, the mobster before he gets killed pulls out like a red handkerchief. Yeah. Um, so it's. It, the, uh, it can be reasonably assumed that, uh, you know, Ricky has like a bull like energy where every the, time the, um, he sees red, he just goes into a blind rage. The umbrella that he stabs the mobster with is also red. Yes, especially yeah. afterwards. It's just red with all the blood. Uh, of the mobster, which I is such a great thing, and I I think it's so funny how much of a just a blind rage Ricky goes in whenever he sees Red, because we even get that later with the uh, yep. the psychologist that's interviewing him. Uh, he has like a, a handkerchief with a red R on it. B. It's a B. It's a Not B. It yeah. yeah. His but... last his last name is Bloom or whatever, but yeah. Yeah, and obviously it can be implied that that might be part of the reason Ricky went into even more of a rage. You know, it's not yeah. directly said, but yeah, like it, it plays opinion, into yeah. it. Yeah, than it is um, well, we can we can say from this point in the film onwards, we don't have to get too terribly into specifics. But from this point in the film onwards, all the logic disintegrates completely. <laughs> Goes right out the fucking window. And and the entire film becomes an absolute fever dream. Now, what I will say in in defense of the film uh, on this respect is that it is all from it is all based around well, largely based around Ricky's narration. So we are we are approaching any sequences of his past from the perspective of an unreliable narrator. So the fever dream moments uh, I found to be fairly apt and justified within the framework of the movie, which was great for me because I was able to in- enjoy it much more thoroughly uh, as well. And I was like, I oh mean, yeah, reality's it, out the window. It's it's an unreliable narrator. Like, they can gets, do whatever the fuck they want. And it, it was pretty, hilarious. It gets pretty fucking funny from this point, like... I mean, he starts dating this girl and after uh, she runs into his motorcycle, and he very slowly uh, tips over. 
Yes. Um, yeah. He bumps into her. Which is bumps, very bumps good. Into her literally. Gently. And they then f- they bump into each other gently. Yeah, they fuck and he And this movie has a lot of tasteful side boob in it. Tasteful side boob. Like, that was that was a lot. Tasteful and yeah. tasteful side ass. Yeah. And there's like a like a top gun level like yep. montage sex scene, you know, between him and his girlfriend. <laughs> Um, yeah, you get the, the, the saxophone when she's first introduced and everything. My favorite scene, though, with her is afterwards, they're going to the movie theater, and what is being shown at the movie theater but Silent Night, Deadly Night 1? Well, when you say movie God theater... God damn it, Matisse. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Personally, I enjoyed it. I was, I was adding ambiance to your, to your and narration. Nuance. The story, yeah, it was, it was enhancing you your dialogue. fucking drunk motherfuckers. Um, uh, it was enhancing your dialogue, Ben. Uh, but this no, is the drunkest think... episode since uh, the Rob Zombie episode. <laughs> You're gonna go back and edit this episode and be like god damn it so i was so I was fucking so drunk, drunk in the Rob Zombie. yeah Here's and you're so thought, drunk though. right now i'm gonna this is a note to matisse when he's sober slash hungover and editing this podcast right now you are too drunk and you should not do the podcast this goddamn here's, drunk here's what i'm I leaving say. i'm leaving this in the podcast here's here's my bit i started this podcast over I, i'm i'm less sober now but uh, at the beginning, on, honestly, like I, I've, I've found the majority of the the drunken debauchery to be fucking hilarious. Cre- credit where credit is. I, 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 I thought, it, I thought, I've, I've found. It You're making funny. this moment weird, Cleve. <laughs> You're making this moment fucking weird. Just, 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 just. We'll, we'll move on. It was, it was a, it was a bit. It was a good bit, and then we're, we're making it. <laughs> Continue, please. So there's a great scene in the movie where uh, they uh, Ricky takes his girlfriend to the the movie theater, and what is being shown at the movie theater but Silent Night, Deadly Night one, which makes no sense. Which is incredible. It's so funny, and he's like, "Oh, this is very good." Um, in addition, there's this. Uh, insane weird character in the back of this very very tiny theater it's somebody it's somebody's like garage room yeah like it's not a movie theater theater. yeah like it's definitely somebody's like garage but they're yeah it's funny what they spend money on in this movie speaking of which and what they don't true because they put a lot of money into a few choice shots and no money into locations like a theater. <laughs> you, know, you know what though? You know? I, I think I think mad respect. Like I, I think that they they approach their budget the best way they could is oh shit, you know, like it's gonna cost us like like a hundred couple hundred bucks to like rent out a movie theater and stuff. Oh no, we we're already putting all our money into our flaming car budget. I mean, we can't we can't take anything out of that. Like and hey, kudos to that. It probably would not have cost that much to shoot in a in a small theater if they shot in the morning uh, when they're not showing movies. Oh yeah, I mean I like <laughs> like this was That's true. This That's was true. I think mostly a lazy choice on their part. Um but I want to talk a little more about the heckler in the back who's like just uh heckling the movie, heckling everyone else in the theater and, and throwing popcorn at his silent friend sitting next to him. And Eric who, Freeman who just looks pissed off the whole time. And at a point that Eric Freeman just disappears out of the seat yeah, next the, to his the girlfriend. The narrator, yeah. the person who and is recounting this um, event. Inexplicably he just disappears and then this other man materializes from the seat behind her. <laughs> this guy named Chip. He's like, "Oh, baby, Baby, we broke up like don't you want to get back together with me and it cuts to the heckler like trying to talk to his friend and all of a sudden Eric Freeman is sitting right next to him well, and then they just disappear behind the seats er- Eric Freeman really likes to just appear right next to someone way too closely he does it several times in this movie where they'll just cut and he'll be like right next within like an inch of someone's face being like, hello there. there. There are a number of people in this movie who have teleporting abilities, and uh, I love it. Yeah. Well, it's mostly Eric Freeman. Well, no, no, no. There are some teleporting police officers as well. Like, like during the the later sequences that were just, are just suddenly there. 
I mean, like the camera cuts like during the during the next I, sequence, like the camera cuts away and then suddenly it's back and there's a, the police officer is just there. You didn't hear a siren. There's no there's no like notification. There's there's nothing. He's just he turns around and then suddenly behind the car, there's a police officer where there was not one like I, moments ago. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the teleportation is a lot more blatant with uh, Ricky. Um, just because it's 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 so dramatic in how close he gets to people and how much he invades their space. Oh no no it's you know? it's, it's comedic. Um, I, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> I think that's uh, but, an excellent segue into the the suburbs sequence, which has uh, maybe one of the most recognizable uh, moments in horror. Just in general yeah it definitely kill sequences it's i think it's it's one of my top like favorite moments I in mean, cinema we, period we, we have we have Jesus, ricky so we funny. have ricky and his girlfriend just strolling through the suburbs and, and they come they come upon chip who uh we should mention really quickly in the last scene he was just hitting on uh the girlfriend blatantly obviously oh and yeah it was in front of his current date who is just like standing right, there waiting right, for right, him right, to right. go with the big and hair. take the ride. Yeah. His current date with the big hair named, of course, Roxanne. Like, it's just so many cliches just stacked on I mean, top they're cliches now, but that's just the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's just the 80s. Like, it may be a cliche looking back on it, but... Well, well, they, they come across him in the suburbs, and uh, Ricky... He, Chip is fixing his car, and Ricky shoves uh, a, a uh, battery clamp in, in his mouth and electrocutes the fuck out of dude to the point that his eyeballs explode and it shatters his glasses and it's awesome it's it's so awesome um, and then he kills his girlfriend inexplicably yeah uh, he started you know seeing red and just a, going yeah, punish with a naughty uh, punish with a, with a car antenna he chokes her out and then he just goes on a killing spree in the suburbs and it comes to one of the most meme worthy horror moments ever that probably everybody has seen garbage day um and i'm i'm proud to announce that uh the garbage day sequence exists in a vacuum and you gain nothing from watching the entire movie that you don't get from just watching the clip on youtube so if you've seen that clip of a uh, garbage day um that that's it you got it it's fucking amazing there there was a moment halfway through the first silent night deadly night where i i leaned over to tease and i said uh you know honestly i'm i'm just here trying to build up and figure out what the context <laughs> for garbage, garbage day is day. and i think tease you leaned over and said yeah me too like we we're just like trying to <laughs> trying to figure out what what was how, how the, the first, meaning how the behind garbage day and garbage and day. what what context we were going to get from it and and it part just way, doesn't. yeah part way into the suburban sequence i was like well we're here he's wearing the sweater and still nothing makes any sense to why he would say the words garbage day it and, just and doesn't shoot someone. like he and a, I'm cop, here for it. a cop just shows up inexplicably and points the gun right in his face and he turns around and shoots that cop in the head and takes well, the, the gun camera, the takes camera the, the gun. shot the shot changes and suddenly the gun is facing towards the cop he doesn't like do a judo yeah. maneuver or anything to shoot the cop just suddenly by the magic of editing the cop dies it's fantastic oh, it's so right. wonderfully and then, over the and then top we, yeah. and then we get garbage day and then like four cops are there well we should say we also get the the car shot the car there's you there's know? yeah there's a car Oh, that yeah. hits a hits a ramp that's there and it narrowly misses Ricky. And it's it, great too. Like it's a great stunt it, shot. Like it, the guys, it, the guys standing like in the middle of the road, like the 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 stunt actor, like uh, or or Ricky, facing the opposite direction, um, is is looking down the road and a and a car like a car is coming down the road. He fires his pistol at the car and we get this beautiful sh shot yeah of of the car hitting a ramp just to the right of of Ricky's character and the car flips over just narrowly avoiding him and it's 
it's excellent. I, I loved that shot. And then, and then of course, after hitting this small ramp, the car just inexplicably blows up. Yeah, it's like, it's like, it's no like oh, we can't pay for no a theater, reason. but we yeah. can put half of our budget on this single shot that we only have one chance to get where the car flips and explodes. Love it. It's so over the top, and I'm so here for it. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, really it's, funny. It's, it's awesome. And then all of these cops show up. Ricky shoots people and it's just it it doesn't make any fucking sense at all like honestly everything after the the literal stock footage of silent night deadly night one everything after that is a fucking nonsense fever dream but it's so funny and so goddamn entertaining yeah it's a fever dream that i i was happy to be a part of it's a yeah like it's it's nightmarish in in its in its sense of logic and then we cut back to ricky in the in the cell where he's being interviewed and we see that just the the psychiatrist who's interviewing him is just dead. We don't see Ricky killing him or anything. We don't know how he killed him. He's just dead all of a sudden. And then Ricky just escapes. Well, didn't he have the some of the the audio tapes around his neck? Is it, was that yeah. what that yeah, was? Yeah, I think it was. was. Strangled he was strangled by Ricky. He got strangled by some. And some the funniest audio part tape. is they. For some reason, the tape played right the moment when he was killed, and you hear uh, the the like guard outside being like, "Oh no, he's right. loose! Yeah, he's loose." Speaking of which, we should mention the guard because we forgot to mention him at the beginning when he's shown at the very beginning. This guard, he is so over the top. <laughs> <laughs> he just like. They always like, <laughs> like, uh, just quick pan ins to him. Uh, well, he, he brings in the tape recorder at the beginning, and they have this whole se- sequence where he's like plugging it in, and like Ricky flicks the lighter, and he like turns around dramatically, like looking at him. And then he, and then the doctor tells him, Get the hell out of here. Yeah. And he leaves the room, and Ricky starts yelling, and he bursts back in the room. They do all these weird punch ins too on him. I, True. it was so funny. Yeah. And, the funniest part was when he like went into Ricky one more time or came into the room to see Ricky to make sure nothing was happening and uh, the psychiatrist was like it's okay you, you don't have to be in here and he just looks at Ricky and waves his finger but he does it side to side <laughs> like yeah, no does. person I've ever seen <laughs> like instead of like wagging his finger he moves his whole hand side to side he waggles his finger in a way that no human being <laughs> would ever waggle their finger it's, it's incredible it's awesome but uh, the Ricky kills the psychiatrist, and he uh, inexplicably finds a Santa costume. He kills somebody. We see him in a phone booth, and the dude he's killed. And then just he, the goofiest expression on this dude's face. And he he goes to kill the mother superior who has had a stroke and she's retired and she lives in this big house in Beverly Hills or whatever, uh, the number of which is 666. Get it? Oh! She had a stroke, but, but they, they... She has, like, a face tumor now? They because fucked that's up. what happens they, they when they you have a stroke? Up, yeah, they fucked up half of her face. It's like, called the, the makeup what... artist got really excited. Like, they, like, they that's just what got happens very overzealous. I thought it was really fun, though, honestly. I thought oh, it was great, it, yeah. the makeup for her was great. Well, yeah, we have this whole great scene of him, like, going after her and her, like, trying to escape and... Like moving the 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 chest of drawers in front of the door as he's like axing through it, and it's very shining, reminiscent. Where he's like looking through the door. Rep, I mean, reminiscent's an understatement. I mean, it's like yeah, rip, they, straight rip off. Yeah, okay. like they they were like just absolutely like just trying to. And then finally, that we we get this great scene where the cops and uh, Sister Mary show up. And the and Mother Superior is like sitting at the table and they like touch her and her head falls off. Right. So somehow he chopped her head off and put it back on her body without any blood anywhere. It's very um, good, honestly. And then he, sho- <laughs> and then he, he magically appears. Oh, 
and they they shoot him a bunch of times and then he oh, after he's been shot and he's lying on the ground his eyes open and the movie's over to imply that uh Ricky's still <laughs> he's still alive or whatever yeah, well, we should mention that there is a third movie that continues Ricky's saga. Well, there's a third and a fourth and a fifth. Yes. Well, and also a remake, right? The, uh, remake. the fourth and the fifth are standalones. The fourth, um, the fifth, the but apparently, key, the murder lift. <laughs> apparently after Ricky gets shot multiple times, including with a shotgun. Oh, yeah, like right in the chest. You like, know, and falls sure, through a window. He should for sure be he, dead. He's, he's, you know, he's not dead. We got to keep the series going but, somehow. Yeah. <laughs> but, hey, it looks like the way the series continues to go is pretty all right. Like, hey, it's... I'm, I'm pretty keen on it because all I know is that in the film descri- in the description for the third movie, I saw the words ESP and uh, maybe <laughs> psychic as well. So I'm pretty keen on. Uh, well, yeah, where they well, go from well here. we might have to cover the the sequels in next year's episode because that's the, Christmas time. Yeah, because yeah, the third movie it's directed by Monty Hellman, who Ow. is. Uh, in art house, uh, American, I would say, auteur of a director. He did uh, one of the greatest uh, road movies of all time, Two Lane Blacktop. How uh, did he do this movie? Ah, um, my head, ow! Yeah. Uh, it has Bill Mosley in it, ow. It has Bill Mosley <laughs> in it. It has Robert Culp in it. Ah. Um <laughs> Uh, Monty Hellman has called it his best work. Oh! Um, not necessarily his best film, but his best work. Oh, um, my head. Unlike the first two movies, it was direct to video. So yeah, there's a lot going for it. Um, and then Spoilers. on top of that, on top of that, the the fourth movie is directed by Brian Usna oh! of Reanimator fame. Um, and then the fifth one is written by Brian Usna, and it has Mickey Rooney in it. Ah! So, um, and then on top of that, the remake uh, it stars Malcolm McDowell. Oh! So yeah, this the series is. This is the most confusing series of all time. My brain hurts. Now. <laughs> it is something. Well, one thing I, uh, two things I want to touch on briefly before we get into ratings. First, uh. I want to give a special shout out to the uh, new uh, Blu-ray that came out for this movie um, just earlier this week. It has a Criterion Collection level of uh, attention to detail. Special features. And special features. Uh, it has three commentary tracks. One has Eric Freeman on it, who uh, I should also mention uh, because after this movie, Eric Freeman just disappeared on off the face of the earth basically no one had any contact with him no one knew where he went he kind of just vanished um and then in the years since this release you know obviously it's become a cult classic and uh garbage day has become a legendary meme and Garbage day. Only a couple years ago did he resurface. Uh, he got in contact with a few people who were writing articles about where uh, in the world he went and trying to figure it out. And just next year, we're getting a documentary called Finding Freeman, all about uh, what happened to him since uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night 2, which I'm actually really excited for. Because I think he's such a fascinating character um, because he's so funny and good in this movie that it's weird to know that he wasn't in really much of anything after it and he kind of just vanished. Um, So I think it'll be really interesting and I kind of want to cover it. He, uh, when he resurfaced, he was in Raleigh, so I think he might be a North Carolinian, you know, a native of the area. So that's super cool as well. Um, yeah, I'm pretty interested in checking that out as well. Do y'all want to rate this movie? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I guess I'll start. I, I will stand by that, like, if you haven't seen either of these movies, you might as well just watch the second one because you get the recaps of the entire 
first. <laughs> yeah. You get the recap of the entire first movie yeah. in the second one. Edited at a much more reasonable pace. Um, just, just chopped down ridiculously. The entire first movie cut into 25 minutes, but you still get the whole thing. Um, so it's whatever, but everything after that is pretty, uh, bizarrely hilarious. There's, there's a lot of like extremely weird continuity mistakes. The whole thing feels like a just completely bizarre fever dream, but I thought it was pretty funny and I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, so I'll give the second one the same as the first, a, uh, three and a half out of five pods. It was hilarious. Garbage day. Yeah. Um, so unlike the first film, I'm, I'm struggling for the opposite reason. I, uh, I think, uh, especially if you haven't seen the first one, this film is, is that much more enjoyable. Like, uh, much like Tease, I, I spent the first uh, 30 minutes of this film uh, just sort of browsing Reddit because we were just, I was just having to, to bear witness to what I'd already seen uh, as it recapped the the entirety of the previous film. Knowing that the, the director had to make do with the, the production company um, uh, insisting that he re uh isn't just repurpose the footage of the first movie like i i find that to be fairly impressive uh in in hindsight so if you haven't seen the first movie yeah i i would i would highly recommend the second one and not recommend uh, and and not advise uh skipping the first half but considering all those factors i i'm i'm now struggling to go for either 3.5 or a 4 i i i loved the second movie um and it had none of the the problems that i had with the first film it left me free to to laugh and and enjoy those things uh much more and so i'm i'm gonna say 3.5 i i thoroughly enjoyed this this the sequel uh uh and and far more than the first one for that even though there was much less footage it is a sequel and as a sequel, I think it fails in a lot of ways just because, you know, it is spending so much of its time recapping. However, as a standalone film, it does succeed much more. Well said. Um, that being said, if you're going in as a sequel, as many people will, especially as sequels are structured, you're almost expected to. Um, you won't get a ton out of how this movie is structured um i think due to you know the low budget and the limitations placed on the filmmakers by the producers they did the best that they could given what they had to work with but i think it is way too long in the beginning and i think it is unnecessary mm -hmm. the the one saving grace of course is eric freeman oh yeah eric eyebrows freeman yeah even <laughs> even if you've seen sorry to cut in um but like yeah even if you've seen the the first silent night deadly night film i wouldn't recommend cutting past that first half hour definitely stop at any of those sequences like the with with eric freeman um which i think is what you were getting at as well but i didn't know yeah definitely uh worth checking out especially if you haven't seen the first one as uh, someone who had watched the first one just days earlier like you both have said like it was fairly boring to go through and uh you know even eric freeman showing up in those scenes besides the opening scene which is great with the uh the guard you don't really get too much over the top eric freeman until it escalates with the new footage but I will say it's incredible footage. It, it gets into a fever dream territory. I love the weird self-indulgent metafiction with them watching the first Silent Night, Deadly Night at the movie theater. I thought that shit was hilarious. Self-indulgent is definitely the word. I thought, I thought <laughs> all of the, the over-the-top stuff really worked. This movie had a surprisingly good camera work a lot of times. Yeah. Um, a lot of there. long shots. Um, that were really surprising. Yeah, overall, pretty impressive in that respect. But as a whole, it fails because it uses too much of that footage, ultimately, I think. I, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 5. I think 
what it does well it does really fucking well and i mean garbage day that whole scene is iconic and you could you can watch that by itself and really take enjoyment out of it and you don't need the whole film to get context for it because there is none that's not saying this movie as a whole isn't enjoyable because there's so much fun stuff to get out of it but it's worth watching by itself garbage day um, that'll give Silent Night, Deadly Night 2 an average rating of 3.3 out of 5 pods. Um, yeah, I, I honestly think you can check this one out over the first one just because you will get every almost everything from the first one plus extra shit. Fuck yeah! Check, check the, the, the garbage day out. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think... That that gives us enough leeway to um to to make our sponsors happy as well. Oh yeah, what about our sponsors this week, Cleveland? Well, uh, this week our our um our notorious sponsors are uh, Chris Kringle's McCrinkles. Um, they're the the folks who who make that delightfully weirdly textured paper that you only find in Christmas uh, bags. I love that that weird textured Christmas Isn't it great? Paper. Oh, I think right below it, uh, the, the copy says uh, their oh, slogan. Yeah. Do you want to yeah, put that um, out for us? Chris Kringle's McCrinkles. The only crinkle that'll crinkle your dinkle. That's so titillating. I know. Isn't it great? And I love reaching into my Christmas bags and finding that crinkle. It, it truly crinkles my dinkle. And it, it really, I get the spirit of the holiday season from it. Yeah, the, the crinkle of the holiday bongle. The crinkle of the bongle! Thanks, Chris Crinkles, holiday bingles, whatever. Don't bungle the Christmas miracle with Chris Kringles. Crinkle that dingle. You definitely can't bonkle the holiday donkle with Chris Crinkles. Binkle McFinkle. Thanks, <laughs> dingle. <laughs> <laughs> what a train wreck. If you like <laughs> If you like the show <laughs> please, please God help you if you like the show. <laughs> if you like the oh. show, uh, Jesus bless you. <laughs> Leave us a, a positive rating, holiday rating, and review on Apple Podcasts. Merry, merry Binkle to your tinkle or whatever. <laughs> um, uh, leave us those reviews, the positive or whatever. Uh, <laughs> follow us on Twitter at Pod People Pod. We're looking into bringing you some stuff in 2019, so it's whatever. Um, follow us on Letterboxd at Pod People Pod. Uh, the movies that we've talked about on the show are there uh, with ratings and reviews and links, and you know what it is. I'm on Twitter at Mr. Van Awesome. I do the drunk tweets. <laughs> and I'm at Mr. Sheets. Uh, I do some drunk tweets sometimes. And I'm uh, sometimes tweeting for Light Arc Studios and can be found on my art station as either Cleveland Mosier or Iron Prism. And, uh, yeah, and uh, occasionally you can find me uh, binkling your holiday bonkle. And there it is! We're the pod people... Happy holiday season times. Hope you're fucking nogged the fuck out like I am. Jesus. Damn Skippy. And this nogged. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> ho, ho, ho. Ho, ho, ho. Bye. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>